well, actually in all cases that I've mentioned, those very high deficit levels did lead to a punctuation in the equilibrium. There was a fundamental change that occurred as a result of that. Is South Africa approaching a tipping point? How might South Africa change into the near future? And what will a future South Africa look like? Well, joining me to discuss is my colleague, John Endres. John, always good to have you here on the channel. Could you give our viewers a sense of where is South Africa at the moment? And how likely is it that the future South Africa might fundamentally change and look very different to the country that we are familiar with today? Yeah, David, um, I think what, what prompted uh, our conversation today is something that came to mind from my studies of change management, um, which was what I did my PhD on. And there are many different models of how change processes unfold in organizations, but the grandfather of them all was a model developed by um, Kurt Levin in the United States. He was a German emigre after the Second World War, uh, who in 1947 was doing uh, experiments with groups and how to change group behavior. And he came up with a, the very basic model where he says that if you've got a certain form of behavior that is in a, in a group and you want to change that, you need to unfreeze the uh, behavior first, then you need to move across to the new behavior and then refreeze the behavior. And that three-stage process of unfreeze, move, refreeze is what uh, made Kurt Levin uh, famous and a household name in change management circles. Uh, and as we look at South Africa now, we see that the country does seem to be a little bit unstable. Um, it feels like there's a, a bit more turbulence coming into the system. And that prompts the idea that maybe what we are approaching is a kind of unfreeze moment that could lead to a kind of move and then to a refreeze. And that is really the idea that I wanted to discuss with you today. Enjoying this analysis? Click here to sign up for our 30 day free trial for more content from the CIA. All right, John, so things are pretty normal, they're in a state of equilibrium for a long time, and then something catalyzes that change. So, so what are the typical catalysts that we tend to see in complex political and social systems? All right, so Kurt Levin's model was very much based on uh, sort of individual psychology and small groups. And so it isn't entirely transferable to, to big uh, complex systems, like for example, states. Um, but certainly, you do have similar ideas coming out of more complex system theories, like, for example, biology, we've got the punctuated equilibrium model that says that uh, species sort of stay stable for a very long time, which you see in the fossil record, and then suddenly there's a big change, um, and then they, they, uh, there's a jump, and you see different shapes and forms appearing quite suddenly, which are contradicted earlier models of evolution, uh, but turned out to be a very useful model for explaining how change happens. And in the case of nations, you also see that where you see things uh, remaining in place for quite a long time, uh, they're chugging along nicely, uh, you get used to the way things are, uh, and you, you do your planning on that basis as well. And you think, you know, the, the past five years, we've seen whatever, 2% growth in our sales. So we'll just look ahead to the next five years, it will probably still be 2% growth per sales uh, yearly, and uh, you, you make your plans on that basis. But what punctuated equilibrium tells you is that sometimes that expectation will not be fulfilled because there will be a break in the equilibrium and things will change very suddenly uh, and very dramatically. In the case of South Africa, we look back in history at the uh, deficit figures. So how much more money does a government spend than it collects? We are currently in a really extreme deficit position in South Africa with a, a deficit of 14% last year which the finance minister is trying to consolidate slowly. But it is such an extraordinary figure that South Africa only three times previously in its history reached comparable uh, deficit levels. And that was in the late 1980s, and it was during the Second World War and during the First World War. So it is historically unprecedented. And what is interesting about this is that uh, in many cases, or actually in all cases that I've mentioned, those very high deficit levels did lead to a punctuation in the equilibrium. There was a fundamental change that occurred as a result of that. Uh, and maybe just going through those three uh, previous cases, uh, in 1922, there was the Rand Revolt. Uh, and subsequent to that, in 1924, the Swats government lost power. After the Second World War um, and, and those deficits, the National Party came to power and introduced the policy of apartheid, which of course was a really a, a quite, quite dramatic uh, change and increase in, in racial 
segregation and differential treatment, discrimination. And then in the late 80s, the deficit of that period was followed by the uh, transition to the democratic government and the elections of 1994. And now we look at today's deficits and try to look ahead into the future. And we do ask ourselves, will this happen again? Will there be a change in administration, a change in governance, uh, a fundamentally different way of approaching the way the country is run? And John, those are economic drivers, but they're also political uh, forces, as you alluded to. And I think one such big epochal change was 2007, 2008. December 2007, we had the election of Jacob Zuma as president of the ANC. 2008 uh, was the global financial crisis. And many of the forces that were unleashed during that time we're still living with today. And many commentators see 2017 as a break from the past when Mr. Ramaphosa was elected as leader of the ANC. But in many respects, that was actually continuity rather than change. Do you want to comment on that? Yes. Um, so I think this is true. I think that there was a, a bigger change in the country's trajectory after the ascension to power of Jacob Zuma. And we see that in many of our charts, uh, deficit charts, debt charts, growth charts, joblessness charts. That first half of the democratic era from about 1994 to 2007 was one kind of era um, in which, uh, uh, during which period many of the indicators were improving. Whereas the period since then, after the great financial crisis and uh, the election of Jacob Zuma, uh, many of those indicators headed in a different direction. I think that this still fits within the uh, framework of equilibrium. I don't think this was a radical change. Um, it is a, a, a sort of change in performance within the same framework. Uh, and that remains true also for President Ramaphosa, where there were some expectations that there would be a break with the past. That hasn't materialized. We still operate within the same framework. Um, but the pressure, I think, is increasing for a change to occur. And it is not just the deficits, it's also the joblessness numbers. It is events like the riots in July that illustrated the growing uh, weakness of the state. Um, it is the uh, growing number of non-voters, for example, in the political system. And you get all these different political and social and economic factors conspiring to create pressure in the system for a change, for a quite uh, dramatic and fundamental shift in the near future. And John, what does the future look like? Uh, we are not fortune tellers, but we can extrapolate some of these trends and try to identify how South Africa might change. What are your thoughts on the potential future trajectory of the country? Yeah, so uh, this is the big question that everybody wants to know, which is what does the future hold? Because if you knew that, you know, you could prepare for it uh, and you could probably also uh, do very well out of it if, if you knew for certain what was going to happen. And uh, many analysts do forecasts or, or, or extrapolations of uh, current trends into the future and then base their description of what the future state might be on those extrapolations. But uh, those often miss the target uh, because they do not take into account breaks in the, in the trend. And that is why the CRA prefers to use a methodology called scenario planning where instead of trying to predict uh, a single future based on extrapolation from the past, you look at what the driving factors are um, that are the most significant and the most unexpected and figure out what combinations of those factors, what impact they will have on society and the economy. And uh, that gives you usually a range of scenarios, uh, different outcomes that are possible. Um, and as a, a student of scenarios, you will be able to prepare yourself for any one of those scenarios which in an ideal case will describe all the possible outcomes. So you won't be taken by surprise. You don't know what's going to happen, but you do have an idea of what's not going to happen and you prepare for the things that could happen. Thanks very much, John. Let's hand over to you, our audience. How do you think South Africa will change in the medium to long term? Also a reminder that John is available for strategic intelligence briefings. These are an exclusive service offered by the Center for Risk Analysis. If you would like to book John for a briefing, I've left my contact details in the description below where you can get in touch with me for more information. My name is David Ansara. This is the Center for Risk Analysis. Until next time, take care.